paper, Dawn of Ragnarok's premise of delving into Norse mythology is a promise to truly investigate one of the most interesting loose ends left by Assassin's Creed Valhalla's story and give Eivor the power of the gods. In disappointing reality, it's a mostly unchanged stretch of gameplay dressed up like a magical romp through the Nine Realms. Replacing European kings with giants and dwarves doesn't change the fact that all of the moment-to-moment -moment adventuring, looting, and combat is exactly the same as it's been in the roughly 150 hours of Valhalla that preceded it. How do you add a whole new set of supernatural abilities without making much of anything feel new or different? Like the two DLC expansions before it, it's not a letdown of Asgardian proportions, but it is a letdown nonetheless. Dawn of Ragnarok channels Christopher Nolan's inception and goes deeper as Eivor, themselves a virtual reconstruction of an ancient Viking, uses trippy drugs to relive the spiritual reconstruction of the life of their culture's gods in order to sort out their own existential dread. This assassinception idea was a clever metaphor during the main game, with Odin whispering increasingly paranoid advice into Eivor's ear every time a new and more bizarre revelation is made about the truth of their world. But the the story is far less poetic here. It's more of a straightforward tale of Javi's quest to save his son Balder from the fire demon Suter. It's a story that is largely standard fare for this series, and especially the Valhallaverse. The characters are well realized and nuanced. Suter, his children, and his wife all stand as enemies in the way of your ultimate end, but they all have their own motivations and sometimes complicated relationships with one another that make them all seem more relatable than your bog standard cackle bad guy. Svartholheim's original residents, the dwarves, are varied in demeanor and opinion, as should be expected from a group of people whose country is occupied by not one, but two factions of colonizing giants. Everyone has their own opinion on what the presence of the Allfather means for them, and chatting up the locals to figure that out can be entertaining if nothing else. Svartholheim is filled to the brim with environments fit for ancient legend. Much of the land looks as verdant and beautiful as many of the locations in England, Norway, or Ireland. It almost has a Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings sort of vibe, where everything looks like a postcard of some natural landscapes that exist in the real world, with the occasional enormous dwarven statue or gigantic mountain made of solid gold. Things do get occasionally weirder when you start seeing enormous statues floating in the air or some burning tree root tentacle thing crawling across the sky. The result is a serene but occasionally chaotic landscape that succeeds in feeling unique among the miles and miles of land Eivor has traveled to this point. Disappointingly, you'll be doing largely the same things you've been doing for a year and a half now across the regions of Svartalheim. Checking off map objectives by finding treasures and mysterious landmarks are made no different by being the god of gods. New light-based puzzles are few and far between. World events return from the base game, but they remain bite-sized versions of side quests that are inconsistent in quality and in compensation for completion. There are new collectibles to find and new elites to hunt, but the process of completing these tasks is the same as ever. The biggest and best new feature of Dawn of Ragnarok is the new Huger Rip, a magical bracer that lets you steal powers from certain enemies and use them as your own. This includes giving yourself fire or frost giant powers for a limited period of time, allowing you to take a dip in lava flows without burning to a crisp, for instance. It also allows you to disguise yourself as the enemy to infiltrate camps, but that novelty wore off rather quickly because it's really only interesting when the campaign makes you do it, and more of a hassle than your normal threat removal strategies. One of the most useful powers comes from a lowly raven. It allows Eivor to transform into a bird and fly across the world or or to reach a tactically advantageous position without having to tiptoe among the enemy. This mostly just serves to cut out the traditional travel time though. What was really underwhelming was the limitations to these powers. You can only have two active at any time, and you can't just select the ones you want from a list you have equipped. If you want to change your active abilities, you have to find an enemy in the world who has it and take it from them. For something like a disguise power, they tend to be well placed and abundant, but all of the others feel sporadic and 
hard to rely on. So even though a power that revives slain enemies to fight for you is great fun to use, in practice, you have to go out of your way to find a poor sap to slay for it in preparation for future challenges. The term challenges is used loosely here because you won't find too many in Dawn of Ragnarok. Boss fights offer a bit of pushback, which the normal rank and file enemies lack, but that's mostly thanks to some special mechanic or pattern you have to adhere to. You see the depth of the new roster of enemy types pretty early in the 20 hours it takes to more or less exhaust this DLC's reserves, and there aren't many examples of campaign encounters to put all of their strengths to use. They're almost all just enemies that behave like ones we've seen before, but with blue and black skin. The few that are truly new, like flame keepers who can bring their fallen allies back to life, are easy to dispatch. Around the end of your journey, the Valkyrie Kara opens her arena, which provides battle encounters that will be the test that combat enthusiasts crave. Besides throwing waves of enemies, both mundane and epic, at you to defeat for prizes, you can turn up the heat by adding boasts, which are modifiers that add stipulations to the fight like making each consecutive melee attack do less damage unless you weave in ranged attacks. Turning up the risk also boosts the reward, but all that grinding is only for armor and runes you could likely do without, especially since this all comes so late in your adventure. A new weapon type, the Ot Gear, tries to spice up combat a bit by allowing you to piece your own short combos together by mixing light and heavy attacks to your heart's content. The wide arcing swipes are perfect for crowd control, but the ceiling for any real skill expression is low. It isn't the offensive game changer the Scythe was in Siege of Paris, but more like its slower, stronger cousin that is fun nonetheless. You can upgrade gear to a new divine level as well, which allows you to slot a new type of rune in them, but as with all the other micromanaging you can do with equipment in Assassin's Creed, you can easily go a whole playthrough without feeling their impact. Divine new setting aside, Dawn of Ragnarok doesn't take the long-standing formula of Assassin's Creed Valhalla to new heights in any significant way. The Huger Rip and new hosts of supernatural abilities are a fun addition to the series, but they're used so sparingly that they don't feel vital. Outside of that, the 20-hour adventure through Eivor's godly alter ego felt much like the last 100 plus hours already spent with them since the main game came out 15 months ago. It's consistently fun gameplay, yes, but also disappointing that Valhalla is desperate for some kind of real shakeup to how it plays. Instead, the only surprises left to anticipate are how Ubisoft is going to repurpose systems we've already seen every bit of to fit into a new theme and setting. The banality of the mostly unaltered flow of gameplay doesn't do the celestial locations and story any justice. For more, check out our reviews of Elden Ring and Shadow Warrior 3. And of course, for everything else, stick with IGN. My husband should have stamped on you when he had the chance. But mercy is no flaw of mine.